Tom Quee presents The Royal Ramble, an episode-by-episode -episode celebration of the classic British sitcom The Royal Family. To get in touch with the show, email us at theroyalramblepod at gmail.com. Hey everyone, Tom Quee here, back again with another episode of my deep dive Royal Family Review podcast, The Royal Ramble. Look, I'll keep it short and sweet this month. As ever, if you enjoy the show and wish to give back, there are multiple ways you can. Uh, you can follow us at Raw Ramble Pod on Twitter for updates on the show and occasional zeitgeisty screen caps. There's the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com if you want to get in touch with your story or your thoughts on any of my thoughts or you know your favourite episodes or any form of communique. That's the Royal Ramble Pod at gmail.com. We're on Spotify, we're on iTunes. You can leave us a five star review over there if you wish go and check all the ones that people have written already you can tell a friend of course too and if you really want to get out of Barbara's bad books and into my good ones you can help us on Patreon yes for a nominal monthly fee you can not only help keep the lights running over here but you can gain access to to many premium items of Raw Ramble content so the next episode of the Raw Ramble will always straight away be there on demand to your phone so in this case if you want to just listen right now to series 2 episode 4 Nana Comes to Stay well that's already on there for your listening pleasure and I'm also recording another two episodes of the quiz this week and they will go on there first too oh and the quiz as well massive thanks again to Sophie for coming through for the first episode of our all new Royal Family quiz show on the podcast the reaction's been great and as always I'm looking for new contestants too so email me the Royal Ramble pod at gmail.com if you want to get involved right that's all the hawking of my wares. So let's get into Nana's Coming to Stay, which was written by Carolyn Ahern, Craig Cash, and Carmel Morgan, directed by Steve Bendelak, and it premiered on the 7th of October, 1999. Okay, and the first thing, as we always tackle, is the title, Nana's Coming to Stay. Something that helps to inform the story, but doesn't necessarily point it in any narrative direction as to what will be happening. Kind of like Bill's Bill's Bill's, if you will. It kind of gives us the flavour, although arguably that title could be for any episode, but it isn't pointed like christening or pregnancy or Jim's birthday. And of course, even though it's in the title, I mentioned this before in the last episode, even though Nana is in the title of this episode and the next one, she isn't in this one. And when she does come to stay in the next one, she comes to stay, but she doesn't really come to stay awake. And indeed, she's just sleeping throughout most of the episode and then awakens at the end, asking, of course, if it's time for the bill. So we fade in and we're behind Jim and Barbara, both with reading materials on their laps. Jim's leg is cocked across his and a newspaper with puzzles is open there. Something that is worth considering as Barbara will mention Jim's fondness for puzzles in Barbara's Had Enough. And we can also see the bare flesh of Jim's arm too, a denim jacket resting on the seat. And aside from the wedding day and I guess when he awoke in series one's Another Woman, I believe this is the first time we've seen Jim not wearing his classic yellow shirt. Barbara has Hello magazine, something we know that both Nana and Denise read from the past episode. And on the TV, we can see Michael Barrymore concluding a game show. Strike It Lucky is how the show is generally known in its format, although at this time it was known as Michael Barrymore's Strike It Rich. And Michael Barrymore, man, there's a uh, notorious figure, huge figure, like I can remember him from the late 90s. I remember my nan in particular being besotted with him, as I'm sure your nan was as well. So Michael Barrymore, just quickly, Michael Kieran Parker, who was born May 1952, known by his stage name Michael Barrymore, is an English actor, comedian and TV presenter of game shows and light entertainment. These included Strike It Lucky, My Kind of People, My Kind of Music, Kids Say the Funniest Things. And in 1993, he even headlined the Royal Variety performance. And as I'm sure you know, Barrymore's TV career effectively ended after the death of Stuart Lubbock in 2001, following a party at Barrymore's house in Essex. So the camera then cuts to the side of the couple, Barb with a constant sig in her hand, speaking to herself on what she's seeing in the magazine. I mean, last we heard talk of Jane Seymour's nursery and Dale Winton's wardrobes. And now? Well, now it's time for Ainsley Harriet's bathroom. And the way Barbara reads it out loud, as if she's encountering something arcane and indecipherable, <laughs> I just love the delivery. A holiday in the Algarve, and the money won there, £1,500. Mm. Still a bad night? You enjoyed yourself? Ainsley Harriet's bathroom. And Ainsley Harriet, I mean, Ainsley Harriet's one of my favourites, I have to say. I love his energy. Kind of in that Dale Winton camp, <laughs> no pun intended, you know, those vivacious screen presences, can't get enough. So Ainsley Harriet, MBE, born in February 1957, English chef and TV presenter. No best for his BBC cooking game shows, Can't Cook, Won't Cook and Ready Steady Cook. Barbara then catches herself, realising that there's an important programme on the other side. Oh, Jim, put BBC on, it's changing rooms. I'm watching that. And I love the meta-textuality here. 
Put the BBC on, says a character within a fictionalised programme on the BBC. Jim says he's watching that, the Barrymore thing, which is concluded. But, I mean, the show was just ending, so what was he watching? He wasn't paying attention. He just doesn't want to watch Change Rooms, is all, I suppose. He's acting out against Barb, too. But we as audience members don't quite know why at this point. And, I mean, to be fair... He doesn't really need a motive, but in this case, there is an impetus of sorts. And we get a full frontal shot of Jim here too, his grubby vest on, covering his unenviable paunch. Loose-fitting jeans are on below that are no doubt the ones that he got off Twiggy for free in the pilot, and I imagine he hasn't paid him back for. So Jim clicks the box, and over it goes on to Changing Rooms. And Changing Rooms, man, what a late 90s juggernaut. Again, a bit like uh, Michael Barrymore-like. So Changing Rooms. Changing Rooms being a do-it-yourself home improvement show broadcast in the UK on the BBC between 1996 and 2004. And it was actually revived this year, at the time of us recording this, 2021, for Channel 4. Changing Rooms was originally hosted by Carol Smiley, and assisting with the remodelling was a Cockney carpenter, Handy Andy Kane. And there was, of course, Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen on there, Linda Barker as well. I mean, I'd done my research before these episodes, but I could have reeled those names off instantly. Like, I don't know why this is stuck in my head so much, this show. And alongside it being a traditional, you know, let's do people's houses up nice type thing, it did have quite an eccentric streak, Changing Rooms. And it gained popularity through the sometimes unusual designs of Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen, and the reaction of some participants who disliked liked their newly designed rooms. Famously, one room of Lou and Bowen's was decorated entirely in animal prints on the advice of the neighbours. The visibly upset homeowners described it as resembling a tart's boudoir and pointed out that the neighbours, also friends, had known of their dislike of animal prints but had suggested them to Lou and Bowen as a joke. So yeah, it's fantastic that Change of Rooms is included here. I mean, really, it was in its pomp at this time. It had just kind of started, you know, the kind of late 90s, early 2000s. That was its domain, that was its stomping ground and it's great that they include it in the show. Immediately, though, Jim isn't happy shaking his head in disbelief at what he's seeing on the TV. Bloody hell, if you call that entertainment watching the cockney knocking nails into plywood. I don't know, is that what it's come to? Shut up, Jim. He is right, but it was novel back then. I mean, now in 2021, we're in the Changing Rooms reboot era, and, you know, we've had stuff like 60 Minute Makeover on Ad Nauseam, the awful DIY SOS as well. Like, I know they do good work on that show, they do very valid work on that show, but Nick Knowles and crew and their forced humour, I just, I just can't really stand that, to be honest. And I like to think, in some meta way, that Jim's comment is perhaps a reflection of the criticism of the royal family at the time, i.e., all they do is sit around and watch TV. Is this entertainment? I mean, I'm kind of imagining that there. I'm pretty sure that isn't their intention, but still, fun to ponder. So they watch Changing Rooms for a bit, and Jim laughs derisively as he sees Lawrence Llewellyn Bowen on screen. And, you know, no doubt like Dale Winton as well. I guess he's disregarding Llewellyn Bowen because he regards him as gay, and that's for some reason a bad thing in Jim's eyes. The camera then cuts to the TV itself, and wow, <laughs> Changing Rooms really stands out as an exotic thing amongst the royal household. On the screen there is Lawrence in a bright powder blue shirt, whilst alongside him someone else on the screen sits in matching blue against a stark yellow background. You know, it's a proper hit of colour here, one that is striking on its own, but here, on a slightly watery CRT against the muted, tired decor of the raw living Living room. Seems like a portal to another world. And I really like Lawrence Lowen Bowen, I must say, and there was a thing I watched a few years ago, it was like the Great British Celebrity Painting Challenge or something like that, and unsurprisingly the guy is a pretty terrific artist, definitely seek out some of his work there. And you know, I wouldn't say there's like animal prints stamped all over it, but you know, it certainly inhabits that world. So Jim calls Lawrence Lowen Bowen a Nancy boy, despairs over him tie-dyeing curtains, and interestingly, again, now, here's a character on the BBC, watching the BBC, proudly declaring that they won't pay the BBC. Look at them, the bloody old Nancy boy, tie down the neighbour's bloody curtains. Your kite and your rainbow. I'm glad we don't pay our licence fee, that's all I can say. We do. I pay it. You what? Oh, Jim, they've got detector vans now. Detector vans, my ass. Barb does it. Good old lawful Barb with a TV licence. You know, Barb who no doubt pays all the bills, all the admin of the house. I can't imagine Jim knowing what council tax ban they're in or when the blue bins are due or anything of the like, you know. He states they wouldn't charge if they knew they were watching bloody changing bloody rooms. More like changing channels, he says, which I actually remember that joke from back in the day. I mean, slightly played out there. And the TV licence, well, 
In the British Islands, any household watching or recording live television transmissions at the same time they're being broadcast is required by law to hold a TV licence. This applies regardless of transmission method, including terrestrial, satellite, cable, or for BBC iPlayer internet streaming. The television licence is a form of taxation and the instrument used to raise revenue to fund the BBC. Since April 2021, the annual cost is £159 for a colour licence and £53.50 for a black and white licence. Uh, who has a black and white licence? Some hipster. Barb then stubs out another Siggy and doesn't pay any mind to Jim. She enjoys the escapism of the show. I like seeing people's houses get done up. It's very popular, is this, Jim? Jim can't be happy for other people. I mean, this has been established many times in the show. And the father of the house then wonders if the changing rooms crew can't come round to theirs and witness him at work. Well, why don't you do an hour and a half film of me mulching in the bloody box room? <laughs> Jim, we will actually see decorating in the next series, but as you probably know, he barely gets anything done then anyways. Jim then turns his attention back to changing rooms, accusing the two on screen of sitting on their asses as the camera pans out and shows Jim and Barb doing just that. Beside Jim too, we can see a caddy of sorts, storing old magazines and such that doubtless just gestate there. And on top is the remote, within quick reach of the master of the house in his chair. To what Jim says though, Barb says she's ashamed to let anyone come to the house. And those insecurities surfaced in the last episode too, as she said she had given up trying to make the house a show home. Jim gets another attack into Nancy Boy, and then Barb takes inspiration from the show in the form of stenciling kitchen cabinets, which is a type of arty quick fix that the show peddled continuously. I mean, we know the kitchen quite well by this point watching the show. Can you imagine a stencil cabinet within there? Again, the stencil my ass comment is a bit obvious, a bit low-hanging fruit, but, you know, even low-hanging fruit can still taste good. There's nothing he'd like better than to stencil my ass. Well, I wish he would. That'd keep you quiet. <laughs> nothing he'd like better. The fact that she says that would keep you quiet. I mean, I know she's just responding to Jim, trying to put him down like he's just interrupting her, but, like, it just conjures such an image of Ricky Tomlinson and Lawrence Oil and Bowen. Anyone familiar with Jim will paint it. I'd love to uh, ask him to put an image of that out there. Barb then says to Jim that he has no imagination, which she doesn't really, and it's something that she will dwell upon in, yes, I keep going on about it, my favourite episode, Barbara's had enough, you know, I think that's just the centre of the show, or at least in terms of the Barbara and Jim dynamic, you know, it's the centre there. But she doesn't mean it kind of in an expansive way, she just means it in terms of his interior design outlook, rather than his general mental interior. He doesn't see what she means when she's talking about the house, though, and she can only laugh despondently. The bell then rings. Jim tells Barb to hide the telly as it may be the detector vans. In the back, we can see the ironing board propped up. It seems particularly gloomy in the living room this episode. Certainly noticeable as we pan back to changing rooms and see Carol Smiley on the telly, who of course gets a smiley my ass from the vested curmudgeon in the corner. It's Dave and Denise, of course, who are at the door. They enter, greet each other. Hi. Hi. Barbara. Are you alright, Dave? Bloody hell, that's the last thing we want. Torval and Dean back again, eh? Hey, Dad. Sit down, oh, Jim. And Torval and Dean, of course, are Jane Torval and Christopher Dean, they being English ice dancers and former British European Olympic and world champions. At the Sarajevo 1984 Winter Olympics, the pair won gold and became the highest scoring finger skaters of all time for a single programme, receiving 12 perfect sixes and six 5.9s, which included artistic impression scores of 6.0 from every judge after skating to Morris Ravel's Bolero. One of the most watched television events ever in the UK, their 1984 Olympic performance was watched by a British TV audience of more than 24 million people. So the newly pregnant newlyweds enter, Denise wearing a little zipped up piece, Dave with a red shirt on and a jacket, a jacket we'll be getting to shortly. And I like how Jim says that he hasn't seen them since yesterday. I mean, we've had Sunday dinner, so let's say theoretically this episode takes place on a Tuesday, which would make the yesterday make more sense for a Monday. Although this could even be a Monday, like when was changing rooms on? I'll have to uh, double check the schedule in there. Jim says to be careful as Barbara may stencil them, and Denise realises that changing rooms is on, something she loves and Barbara concurs, shooting Jim a smug side eye. Barbara then spots Denise's trousers and gets really quite excited by them. Off the market, seven nine nine. You know, Jim could not care less though. Oh, you are with it, are Denise? Oh, the irony. Of course she isn't with it. I mean, she's buying stuff from the market. Stuff we don't even really get to appreciate at this moment, but Jim will highlight later in the episode. And as they're all talking, changing rooms is still playing. We can hear the decorators talking about talking to Pammy, which is a, Pammy's like a tailor's dummy that they can exhibit things on. And the show then relaxes for a moment. We hear changing rooms playing on. And then Barbara realises that Dave and Denise have been to the antenatal. 
And they write Denise so brilliantly here, her voice, like, saying, this midwife woman, what was running it? You know, you know, what did she say about Twiggy, that new lady friend, what you've got then, and stuff like that. Like, it's just pitch perfect. And here, following this... Now, I don't know if I was just an emotional child, because <laughs> there were certain things that I would see, certain things in TV shows and movies that always kind of bum me out, and made me feel quite sad, but in quite a powerful way. Like, I like the sense of, like, you know, there was a real feeling in my chest when I heard this. And I don't know about you, you know, I, maybe this isn't going to be on the top ten saddest royal family moments, which no doubt I'll have to count down in the future. I'm looking forward to doing this. But um, this whole sequence to me, so bittersweet, so perfect. I didn't really know what to say about Dave. I just said about, you know, his disco and about the removals that he does and that, but there isn't much else to say about him, really. Mm. Quite a sad moment, isn't it? Like, quite tragic dwelling, you know, Dave dwelling on how there's not much to say about him. And we've spent a lot of time with Dave at this point. We've learnt a lot, you know, about his parents and about his DJing and about his work and about his stuff. And, you know... There is quite a lot to say at the grand scheme of things, and it is played for laughs as well. But as always with the royal family, there's a little stinger amongst the petals, you know what I mean? You're meant to laugh, but there's something, at least to me, quite upsetting about the proposition here. And it's interesting that Denise says it's a bit weird, really. Not perhaps in the sense that they had to hold baby models or do exercises or something like that. Rather that they had to introduce themselves, they had to talk out loud, talk about their partners. I mean, consider the dismissive laughter that accompanies the revelation that Anthony's going to play party games with Emma's family at Christmas later in the show. I mean, any form of self-expression here in Raw Land is downplayed and unappealing. You know, it's not to say that they don't like each other's company. I mean, consider Jim's banjo, for God's sake. But I suppose this sort of thing is unprecedented for the most part in their lives. And, you know, some people do find it uncomfortable to talk about themselves in front of people. And, you know, I appreciate that. I mean, clearly I don't have that issue as a podcaster, but still. Denise and adds that she told them how long they've been together, which we learn is five years. Jim acts up sarcastic about it, saying he bets everyone was clinging on to every word. And Denise then questions what's wrong with him, as she's no doubt been witness to many of his tempers before, but, but even she can tell that there's something particularly spiky about his demeanour. And then we learn that it's all down to Barb telling Jim that Nana's coming to stay for a week, delivering that line with a little mirthful chuckle. What's all you, Grammy yes. Take the notice of him, Denise. He's been like this all day. Why? Because I told him Nana's coming to stay for a week. <laughs> It's not definite, Jim attests, but Barbara confirms it is. And we learn that Norma's having her cataract removed. Now, I do we just heard this as like an old person operation, kind of like a hip operation or something like that, or having angina. So until doing this episode, I didn't really know what cataracts, I knew it was an eye thing. So here's from the NHS website. Cataracts are when the lens, a small transparent disc inside your eye, develops cloudy patches. Over time, these patches usually become bigger, causing blurry, misty vision and eventually blindness. When we're young, our lenses are usually like clear glass, allowing us to see through them. As we get older, they start to become frosted, like bathroom glass, and begin to limit our vision. So Norma's having her cataracts removed, and Dave, of who, let's not forget, there isn't really much to say, starts to laugh and perks up, displays a bit of personality, tells Jim that it'll be company for him when Barbara's at work, you know that Norma's never stuck for any things to say, and unlike how we never see these skirmishes between them, you know, obviously we hear the war stories in the next episode about the uh, remote control, etc. But I like how they just let these ideas linger, you know, we, we don't actually get to witness that Cold War face up. Jim then counters that Nana could stay with them, to which Dave counters back. And I love that Sue Johnston interrupts herself here as she responds. It feels very real. I'd love to have Nana staying with us. No way. Do you not? This is my mother we're talking about here. Barbara then fights her corner further, saying she'd have no one to talk to and be on her own after the operation. Jim states the pity that she can't have the cataracts on her tongue, and Barbara quiets him down. Dave then looks across at them slightly, almost like a child making sure the parents are okay, before returning back to Lawrence and his crew on changing rooms. It's then silent for a moment. Jim huffs, asks for a brew, but as Anthony is out with Emma, there's no chance of one unless, perish the fort, they do it themselves. And it's interesting that there's a little bit of progression here. In the last episode, in Sunday Dinner, we just heard of them just being friends, but now Anthony's out with Emma. Barbara then smiles to herself, as she always does, and addresses Denise, calling her our Denise, and elaborates on what Emma looks like. Tiny little thing she is. She's got her own car. Mm. What's she doing with her, Anthony, then? 
Mm, I don't know. Look, a car at 17 is bougie and, you know, a hint of the luxury of Emma's family that we'll learn about later. It's great how also we can hear Linda Barker in the background stating that it'll be about two layers of paint. And Dave then, eavesdropping, or I suppose it's spoken in the whole room, so he's just listening in. Dave simply states to the knees, Anthony's going out of a bird of a car. And Jim can't help himself, as always. So she's the one who needs the cataract operation. Again, referring endearingly, I suppose to his child like Barb did with Denise, as R. Lurch. <laughs> Now, Lurch, of course, is a reference to the Adams Family. I don't think we've done an explanation here. So just quickly, the Adams Family is a fictional household created by the American cartoonist Charles Adams in 1938. The Adams Family originally included, using the names assigned to them for the 1964 TV show, Gomez and Morticia Adams, their children Wednesday and Pugsley, close family members Uncle Fester and Grandmama, their butler Lurch, and Pugsley's pet octopus Aristotle. She looks like one of the Spice Girls, you know. Does she? Mm. And the Spice Girls, of course, I mean, we heard of Piggy Spice there, British pop group formed in 1994. In 1996, Top of the Pops magazine gave each member of the group aliases, which were adopted by the group in the media. So we had Scary Baby, Sporty Ginger and Posh. With their girl power mantra, the Spice Girls redefined the girl group concept by targeting a young female fan base instead of a male audience. They led the teen pop resurgence of the 1990s and became pop culture icons of the decade. Now, Looking back on the Spice Girls, I mean, I find them fascinating as a cultural artifact, and there is currently, at the time of me recording this, a great Channel 4 documentary breaking down their rise. I didn't quite realise how big they were. Their debut single, Wannabe, in 96, hit number one in 37 countries. 37! The camera pans out, and Denise then mivers Dave about taking his coat off. And this is a classic royal family moment here, isn't it? It really demonstrates how the writers can expertly wring humour out of seemingly nothingness, a man taking his coat off. I love how Denise bothers him a little, and then Barbara calmly but resolutely says, take your jacket off, Dave. <laughs> and then the stinger from Barb, you won't feel the benefit when you go out. Denise edges in again on the attack after that, and Jim then just lays down the law. Why don't you just take it off? Take your bloody jackets off, will you, Dave? Bloody hell. Bloody hell's right. Poor Dave. Poor Dave has no autonomy at all. The Royal's deciding everything. Well, whether he wears his coat or not, but still, you know, that's a man's choice. Denise then, watching changing rooms, is inspired, stating that they, her and Dave, could strip the floorboards in the kitchen. Dave responds that it's good line. Oh, yeah. And I adore the way that Craig Cash can make Dave go squeaky when he's het up. We could strip the floorboards in our kitchen. Joe, he's good lino we've got in there. And lino, linoleum, which is commonly shortened to lino, is a floor covering made from materials such as solidified linseed oil, pine resin, ground cork dust, sawdust, and mineral fillers such as calcium carbonate. I bet that's why you listen to this podcast, isn't it? Because you want to hear about lino. Jim poo-poos the idea and then decides to stir further, asking Dave if he's been cooked a meal yet. Not a meal, he says, wincing. A bit different to I don't mind Dairy Lee me from the first episode of this series. Denise then argues that he has his tea at the chippy, so he doesn't need a big meal when he comes back. I mean, first of all, how healthy is that? And Christ, Denise, do you not realise he has it there because you don't feed him? It isn't an excuse for you to excuse yourself. Denise barbs back to Jim, states that he hasn't made a meal himself really, calls him Master Chef, which is of course a reference to the competitive cooking show which originated with the UK version in July 1990 and came back in a revived and updated format in February 2005. And Dave, you know, Dave is back in with the jokes here, stating that Jim's going to get plenty of practice serving dinners when Norma comes, and, and he exaggeratedly raises his hand up to his chin here, I think representing the China Cup, but perhaps just reinforcing the somewhat tumultuous yet hilarious situation that is about to unfold when the two of them spend a week together. Denise and Barb laugh, but Jim then ruins it by piling on another insult, stating that the only time she's quiet is when she's got a gob full, like Jim, and Barbara doesn't like that one bit, sours at it, and immediately frowns from her edge of the sofa. They watch TV a little longer, and then a car is heard pulling up outside. Now, this is the second time we've had the characters staring out the window at a new car, commentating on it. Last time it was Jacko's Motor in the second episode of Series 1, but I think it works again here. I mean, yeah, ultimately it is the same conceit, but the players and the context are different, and, you know, it's skillfully done, as always. So Dave and Denise pop up, we can see Lawrence on the TV, and I really like how Dave gets on his knees on the floor, and Denise up on the chair with her boots showing. You can also see the wedding photo atop Lawrence on the TV next to them, and I always love this shot. So we have the picture of the two newlyweds, you know, in their wedding garb on the left, and then we have them in reality, you know. One of the couples are staring inward from the picture frame, and the other are looking outward 
through the window. And it's great that we see also on Change Rooms, probably the most famous thing from it, that montage of all the work they do, you know, that speeded up, like, all the walls are liqueur and all the linos ripped up, etc. I mean, how easy they make it look. That music, too. You know, it vividly takes me back, that catchy little refrain. Kind of reminds me a tad of the untouchable theme hospital soundtrack, if anyone's familiar with that. What a classic. So Anthony is kissing Emma, we learn. Jim laughs proper childishly. A Tom we haven't really heard from him before. And there's some classic sitcom misdirection too. So Dave says after the revelation of the kiss that she looks all right. But of course he's talking about the car, states it has a nice set of alloys. Denise says that she likes her hair. Denise is quite complimentary. And then asks, as many have by this point, why is he going out with her? But I'm sure many people are thinking that no Anthony outside of the Royals, how is he a member of their family? The message is then relayed that he's getting out. Dave and Denise say it. Barbara repeats to Jim. Lovely stuff. We hear about his hands on the roof of the car, leaning in the window. There's a brilliant reaction shot again of Jim, who, of course, never deigns to leave his throne. He's laughing delighted at all that's going on. They then realise that he's actually coming back, so retreat to their seats. And there is a real sense of excitement in the room on the show at this point. It's palpable, despite blooming changing rooms being on in the corner. Dave, in particular, has a proper cartoonish gawp on him. So Anthony comes in, and Jim immediately starts to conduct everyone as they get into When the Moon Hits Your Eye. I mean, that's a moray, obviously, as a song. And it's nice to hear some of the family struggling to remember the lyrics, despite their enthusiasm for the track. When the stars start to shine like you make too much right out the boy. <laughs> So Ant enters, smugly, nice haircut, sits on the antiquated chair, folds his arms high, defensive but proud, you know, asks how old they all are. Jim refers to him as Romeo, obviously from Romeo and Juliet, and asks him to get the kettle on. And That's Amore, well That's Amore is a 1953 song by composer Harry Warren and lyricist Jack Brooks. It became a major hit and signature song for Dean Martin the year it was released, and Amore obviously means love in Italian. Music critic Joe Queenan has described the song as a charming if goofy parody of popular Neapolitan organ grinder music and observed that That Samore was one of the many songs from the early 50s that helped rehabilitate Italy's image as a land of magic and romance that had somehow been lured from its festive moorings by the glum fascist Benito Mussolini. Barb states that Anthony's back a bit early and we hear that Emma has an exam tomorrow so you know how that goes. Uh, the rabble coo affectionately and Anthony can't help but smile which is sweet. Dave jokes that the exam is the 11 plus, Jim asks where she's from, and Ant says Altrincham. And Altrincham is, I mean, you know, isn't it so great on the Royal Family they get all these little places in Greater Manchester? You really build them up. I'll have to put a sort of map together at the end of the show, you know, because we have like your Nutsfords and your uh, Middletons, etc. Um, you know, you've seen those maps that they have of like England and it's like where all the bands come from and stuff. I mean, it's very niche to have a map of Greater Manchester of places that are mentioned in the Royal Family. But if you're listening to this show, no doubt you'll probably get a kick out of that too. Anyway, Altrincham. Altrincham is a market town in Trafford, Greater Manchester, south of the River Mersey, and it is eight miles southwest of Manchester city centre. At the 2011 census, it had a population of 52,419. Altrincham today is an affluent commuter town, partly because of its transport links. The town has a strong middle class presence, and there has been a steady increase in Altrincham's middle class since the 19th century. Altrincham, of course, then, is a desirable place, and Jim is rubbing his fingers together to Barb to signify the filthy lucre that may be in their future when they marry. And I was thinking, maybe they said this in the show but where are the royal family actually based in manchester maybe i've just missed that but uh, email in the raw ramble pod at gmail.com if you've got any ideas so jim then decries anthony as being lazy i mean how many times they do keep hitting this same note in the show and i don't begrudge them because of it because it is funny but the whole you know how is he so lazy but i'm the lazy one saying it like they, they really just keep doing that joke over and over again don't they but so jim decries anthony for being lazy urged him to make blues for every bloody body uh, the delivery on that is superb barbara laughs affectionately and then asks dave and denise what they've had for their teas what did you have spaghetti all these hoops. Oh. And again, the stinger there in that line, a bit like the alloys line. The, the way that Carolina Hearn as well simply says, hoops, I mean, perfect. And Barbara's return to that, letting us know about what they had for dinner. Not smugly, but just matter of factly. Jim's delivery too, as well. Listen to how sated he is. We had chops. Did you? Yeah. 
Uh, bloody big thick ones like that. That satisfied burr he has. The demonstration of how dense they were. I mean, we've seen the family eat chops in the second episode of series one with Denise and the bean juice. But, uh, you know, life's moved on now. At least for Denise and the prospect of actually nourishing meals, I suppose. Dave looks on, I think jealously... But certainly a recognition there that Denise ain't Barbara in so many ways, and it's going to be hoops in a can rather than chops from the butcher for the foreseeable future. More changing rooms play in the background, and Jim then asks Dave about work. You know, I love the shot too here of Jim in his vest in the background and Dave in the forefront. We hear that the money is hopeless. Jim says they're only paying you from the neck down, which is true. Dave doesn't quite seem to get what he's saying, but they move on. And Dave then relays a nightmare he had that day with a divorce. The man taking all the stuff back as he was moving in. And Jim refers to him here as not being Petra Bloody Celli, which I must admit is a reference that went over my head until doing the research for this episode. So Petra Celli being an American legal drama that ran for two seasons on NBC from September 74 to March 76. Tony Petra Celli is an Italian-American there we go again, Harvard-educated lawyer who grew up in South Boston and gave up the big money and frenetic pace of major metropolitan life to practice in a sleepy city in Arizona. So yeah, the illusion being that he kind of wades into marital conflict and the like there. Barbara, though, upon hearing this, of course, extends her sympathies, and Dave states that it was sad. They had to wait around until she stopped crying for the brew, which, I mean, so many twists in the jokes in this episode, brilliant. We can hear Anthony clinking the glasses in the back, and it's superb here, very subtle and understated, like, I like to think they did this on purpose, I'm sure they did, because, you know, it's bloody royal family, I mean, they don't let things slide here, but there's a shot, just a very, very quick shot, where we see both mother and daughter, Barb and Denise, sitting next to each other, both playing with their hair in exactly the same way, I mean, it's just marvellous, it just really underscores the kind of familial link. It's terrible, really, isn't it? Yeah. They're splitting up and there's our Anthony finding love. Ant comes in with the tray. Tory T is there as ever. They're dished out. The closing theme of Changing Rooms plays. And Anthony seems supercharged by his liaison, as despite her being newly married and pregnant, Denise is still his older sister, and he's still going to get in the jibes here and there. Hey, Denise, uh, are you going down there tomorrow? Where? Kissing me ass. Hey! Hey! I hope you don't say things like that to Emma. Tell you what, she's a lucky little girl, that Emma. She's landed on her feet with you, all right, isn't she? Hey, what were your prospects? Is it going to be Burger King, McDonald's, who knows? <laughs> I bet they must have riveting bloody conversations. Again, too, it's sad to see Anthony being encouraged and then being stomped on. Jim can't help himself. Is it going to be Burger King or McDonald's, he asks. They must have riveting conversations. I mean, Christ, he cannot stop, can he? And McDonald's, I mean, I don't need to tell you about McDonald's and BK, but I'm going to anyway. McDonald's is the world's largest restaurant chain by revenue, serving over 69 million customers daily in over 100 countries across 37,000 outlets as of 2018. And Burger King, well, Burger King, again, is a American multinational chain of hamburger fast food restaurants headquartered in Miami-Dade County, Florida. The company was founded in 1953 as Insta Burger King, a Jacksonville, Florida-based restaurant chain. After Insta Burger King, which, by the way, terrible name, ran into financial difficulties in 1954, it was bought out and the company was renamed rightly as Burger King. Anthony, again, looks aggrieved at this. We go back to him holding his Tory tea mug, upset. I hope she likes The Simpsons, Jim says, and, well, like, this is weird, because you guys know by this point that I am obsessed with The Simpsons, it is my favourite show, it has always been my favourite show, I probably watch one or two episodes a day, if more, I tend to normally watch one in the gym on Disney Plus on my phone, and then when I'm home, like, I can... I've seen certain episodes hundreds of times, like Itchy and Scratchy Land or Bart the Fink, which is the one you might remember where Krusty's the tax cheat. Love that episode from Series 8. Or is it Series 7? It's, it's one of those incredible Bill Oakley, Josh Wines. Like, I'm not trying to, like, be Simpsons nerdy here, but it's just... Uh, the serendipity there is marvellous. It's very similar to how Tom Waits is my favourite singer-songwriter. You guys are probably aware of Tom Waits. And The Wire is one of my favourite shows. So the fact that Tom Waits does the soundtrack to The Wire, the theme song, is just, yeah, crazy. Still, very cool to see Simpsons reference there. Barb says Jim reminds her of Homo, which is great. It's Homer, of course, rather than Homo. And yeah, Jim does undeniably have a bit of Homer about him. I mean, he's the archetypal dad, after all. Barbara then asks if there's any biscuits. 
He says there were none in the barrel, but of course there is a secret cupboard. I mean, there's always these little clandestine areas in the domestic kitchen, aren't there? You know, I'm sure you've got some as well. Anthony heads off. We can hear Animal Hospital in the background with known wrong and Rolf Harris speaking. And Denise, of course, is too pregnant to reach for a mug. So she gestures to Dave, who passes it across and urges her to be careful, which is slightly rich. And you can see Barbara here looking at Dave. Perhaps a bit concerned, a bit perplexed. Of course, she's not against Dave helping her daughter, her pregnant daughter. But perhaps she's realising here how entrenched Denise's pregnancy laziness has already become. Anthony then, from the kitchen, begins to rifle through some classic biscuits here, as he calls out. Wagon wheels first, which Denise wants, then Kit Kats, into penguins. Why can't we open them all? Denise asks. I'm only opening one packet, Barbara says. If I open more, then it'll get et. Which, I mean, is pure mom speak there. My mom has said that phrase so many times in my childhood. Real perfect, on the nose, and just slap bang, you know. And Dave, I mean, look, Dave has stuff about him, all right. I'm defending Dave here. Dave then gets everyone laughing by urging Anne to save some biscuits for Nana and Homo, to which Barbara laments her idiocy here. But, you know, it really isn't that bad that she said Homo over Homer. You know, she laughs to herself so genuinely. And now, we've had biscuits mentioned before in the show and after too. But here is a proper British biscuit sequence, a proper scene, you know, and the biscuit barrel. What a domestic item. And I wonder if other countries worship the biscuit quite as much as we do. You know, we've already seen as well that the royal family love a sing-song, and here they begin to dip, not into the classic songbook of yore, like, you know, when, like, Rod Stewart will do, like, he covers the classic American songbook and some of this, but this is a different type of songbook. Classic adverts of the past, you know, who can forget these mini marvels? And how real as well to just sing the songs of adverts, like, you know, there's an analysis here of kind of post-capitalism and them sort of worshipping the songs of stuff they buy that I'm not smart enough to uh, wade into, but again, let us know the raw ramble pod at gmail.com so dave begins proceedings with the club song if you like a lot of club on your biscuit great tune and denise smiles at him jim responds with the penguin ditty and smiles and then we get a nice shot of barbara nibbling on a club as she begins to sing a flake song which i wasn't aware of uh, you know jim is showed side-eyeing her dismissively as he dissembles his bar on top of the paper and listens i mean jim did just respond to dave's chorus line so why is he being snarky Perhaps it's Barbara's slightly reedy voice, which has been laughed at before on the episode Another Woman. And all these biscuits that I just mentioned, I mean, club, personal favourite for me. Although, I think my favourite, like, I I wouldn't really call a club a biscuit, even though it is more like a bar, you know what I mean? Like, I think a biscuit is more like something you just hold in your hand, something that isn't wrapped, for example. But if we're talking the biscuit bar... Gold is alone there, up top of its medal. So a club, well, a club is a type of biscuit that is covered in chocolate, sold in Ireland under the Jacobs brand, and in the UK under McVitie's. W&R Jacob and Company started producing the Club Milk Biscuit in Dublin just for the breakout of World War I. It became a popular brand across Ireland, with the confection consisting of two rectangular Marie biscuits, forming a filled sandwich using a cocoa cream, then covered in thick milk chocolate. Jacobs originally used images of playing cards from the club suit to illustrate and advertise a new biscuit, hence the club name was therefore a reference to this suit and penguins penguins are milk chocolate covered biscuits filled with chocolate cream very similar to the club actually although they taste very different and of course probably the most famous thing about penguins is that each wrapper has a joke or funny fact printed on it and imaginative often humorous designs featuring penguins that often pastiche famous works of art and finally flake flake is a british brand of chocolate bar currently manufactured by cadbury consisting of thinly folded milk chocolate the bar has a unique crumbly texture and softens but does not melt when heated The original Flake product was first developed in 1920 and was discovered by chance by an employee of Cadbury's at the Bourneville factory who noticed that the thin streams of excess chocolate falling from moulds cooled into flaky ripples. And the family don't really respond to Barb singing, but she laughs to herself. Jim laughs off camera concurrently. Everyone is shown eating their chocolate. And then Jim starts to sing another, which I've actually never heard of. She flies like a bird in the sky. She flies like a bed, I wish that she was mine. And what a marker of a generational shift, though, being able to sing advert themes by heart. I mean, I bet if you ask my generation, they'd struggle. You know, even me at 29, I'm struggling to think of, like, loads of themes where I'm like, oh, yeah, this is the one, like, 
it'd be like terrible ones these days like um auto glass replace that one and then we buy any car and like there's no real ones for food anymore you know which is a bit of a shame anthony is shown still watching tv and kind of apart from it all uninterested the rest of them however this quartet they're in it conducting proceedings with their rapper wands there's a superb cut to from anthony completely apathetic to dave and denise mugs and chocolate singing along straining and failing to hit those higher notes and man, everyone knows the lyrics to this song, Can't Let Maggie Go. Again, I've just never heard of it. Jim then plays Quizmaster, and we will soon enough learn how he loves a millionaire. And he's asking Dave what the theme was for, who responds promptly and correctly that it's for nimble, real bread, but lighter. And Denise gives a little swing of joy at that, impressed as she will be on Dave on the Lighthouse family questions, impressed at Dave as much as when she learns about his Lighthouse family knowledge in the Millionaire episode. So Nimble, there's not too much on Nimble on the internet, but I got this from a blog of a person kind of celebrating old adverts and the like. Nimble, real bread but lighter, was the slogan in this early 70s advert. The advert, I remember, was of a lovely young woman, who was older than I was at the time, in a balloon and singing the song I Can't Let Maggie Go by Honey Bus, which was the accompanying background. Nimble bread was marketed towards slimmers, I think, but when we had it, it was usually because there was no proper bread left in the shop. Though I didn't need to lose any weight then, this bread made great crunchy toast. And I Can't Let Maggie Go. I Can't Let Maggie Go is a song by the British pop group Honey Bus from early 1968. Written by a band member Pete Dello, it was released as a non-album single. The song became an international top 20 hit, reaching number 13 in New Zealand and number 11 in Ireland. It did best in a native UK, however, where it reached number 8 in the UK singles chart. Correct, young man, Jim says after Dave's answer, and the camera then pans down his body slightly. We can see a liver spot of sorts on his chest, his man boobs resting. His skin, I mean, he's never been abroad after all, his skin is quite pale with the chocolate bar still held in his hand. And I don't know about any of you, but perhaps the most unrealistic thing about this show is the fact that they don't scoff their chocolate all in one go. I mean, I know I do, and I imagine Jim would too, but then again, there's no real fun in that, is there? It just it seems to take such small bites, but they've got to make it last for the scene. The camera then moves along to Barb, who we see is taking a bit more of a sucking the chocolate approach than eating it, and she seems in ecstasy. I mean, you'd be convinced that they were all taking deep drags of a dense blunt rather than a supermarket 10 for a pound chocolate bar set, but eating sweets is a very pleasurable experience, of course, and you know who can deny that? Denise then looks at Dave, holds her wagon wheel lovingly towards him, who himself gives a satisfying hmm as he's with his chocolate. Anthony, however, is a bit of a gannet finishing it off with big clumps and then scrunching the wrapper up into his hand, sniffing a little, his eyes never off the TV. Jim, however, isn't ready to leave this confectionery chat and is dwelling on some of his favourite ads. Do you know what the best advert was? Bar none. Cadbury smash. Mm. We peel them with our steely knives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Cadbury Smash. I mean, my knowledge of some of these adverts comes from, you know, people remember back in the day, like in the early 2000s, Channel 4 endlessly did these top 100 compilations of, you know, best songs, best, I think Jonathan Ross did best toys, that was a good one, and going for all this different stuff of UK cultural history, which was fascinating to me as a kid, and I remember seeing Smash on there, and Smash, well, Smash is a brand of instant mashed potatoes in the UK, it was launched in the UK in the 60s by Cadbury, nonetheless, which was primarily a manufacturer of confectionery at the time, however, it was not until 1974 that Smash became popular in the convenience food market after Cadbury launched an advertising campaign featuring the Smash Martians, which is obviously what Jim talks about, who would watch humans preparing mashed potato the traditional way on television instead of using potato granules and laugh at them. The adverts of the 70s and their catchphrase for Mash Get Smash were voted television advert of the century by Campaign magazine and second best TV advert of all time in a poll of April 2000 conducted by the Sunday Times and Channel 4, being beaten only by Guinness's Surfer advertisement from 1999 you'll remember that one with the horses coming out the waves and the tick follows talk and you know that that is a pretty epic advert to be fair Anthony has no clue what's going on, and to be honest, I didn't at the time. Looks across perplexed at Jim as he's making some odd, hilarious sounds. And Barbara then talks about the tea ad with all the chimps, the PG Tips one, which I do remember, and everyone, even Anthony says, oh yeah, you know, that was more of a 90s advert. Barb then asks Jim how they did it, and Jim then fashions that into an insult for saying that, you know, he wished the chimp trainers could train Anthony into making a proper brew, which is deliciously ironic, as just as he says that, he scratches indulgently under under his armpit, just like a chimp would do. The family laughs, 
Anthony pops his cuppa down, and I love the choice here directorially to stick with Anthony, but we can see Dave and Denise slightly across from him in the shot. Denise then telling Dave that she's finished now, and he puts everything back for her. Barb shoots another glance at this, at that, I'm finished now, wow. I mean, that's something a child would say. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing for me to talk about this, but I'm sure a lot of you this well, when you're a child, a young kid, and, like, you need your parents to, like, wipe your bum, I remember shouting, I'm finished, and stuff like that. But that was when I was free, not when I was a pregnant woman in my late 20s, you know. Denise says she's dying for a wee, something that will essentially force the end of the episode. And there's an awesome shot of just her face straight on as she talks, the old tired design of the sofa behind her, the thrill of the cushions essentially framing her. Why don't you go now and get it over with? I just got comfy. Oh. Oh. You know I'd go for you if I could, don't you? Yeah, thanks. You know I'd go for you if I could, which is a bit of an abstract thought, but the intent is true. It's a very sweet, motherly thing. It, it, it's very on point for Barb. Barb then asks Denise how she's been. She says dead busy, which by now we know is the complete opposite. And I like how she goes, oh, dead busy in a way. And Barb sort of agrees with her. But of course, they haven't been that busy, or at least Denise hasn't. I mean, Barbara has been working at the bakery and, you know, trying to keep it a show home and all that. But no, Denise has been watching uh, a few programs. Jerry Springer, of course. Jerry Springer was an American syndicated tabloid talk show that aired from September 91 to July 2018. Produced and hosted by its namesake, it aired for 27 seasons and nearly 5,000 episodes. In 1999, ITV made 12 UK-based versions of the series Jerry Springer UK, which was filmed at the same studio as his US show. Denise then states she's dead mad at herself because she fell asleep and missed Pet Rescue. <laughs> I mean, what must Dave think listening to this? You know, whilst he's playing makeshift marriage counsellor out there, she's snoozing to daytime TV. But it being Dave, of course, he probably isn't listening. And even if he is, he's not that bothered. And Pet Rescue, I don't really remember this show, but it was a British daytime TV show broadcast on Channel 4, launched in January 97. It chronicled various pets and animals being rescued, cared for, and then either rehoused or returned to the wild. And it's going to be daytime all the time, by the sounds of it, when Nana's coming over. Kilroy, Trisha, Richard and Judy. And, you know, Jim also has to do a bit of work here and make sure he's manning the video correctly. Making sure to record one show when it's clashing with the other, so Nana can get the most out of this programming. One eye or not. And Trisha, I mean, I love Trisha. I forgot Trisha. She's great. Trisha Goddard, formerly called Trisha, is a British tabloid talk show hosted by Trisha Goddard. It initially aired on ITV in the mornings from 98 to 2004, before moving to Channel 5, where it was broadcast until 2010. Jim then learns that Nana is going to have to stay another week when she has the other cataract done too, to which she gives a marvellously curt response. Bloody hell, is she going to watch all these with just the one eye? Well, she can't have both cataracts done at the same time, can she? So she's going to be staying here again when she has the other one done? Yes! Bloody hell, fire! Ant then pops up and asks Dave about getting a gig in the feathers. Barb then urges Anthony to tell them all about his new venture, which is nice because it gives the backstory that Barbara knows about it, Barbara's happy about it, she wants to encourage it, you know, that Anthony's told her, and the rest of the family are in the dark until this moment. Anthony! I told them about your new venture! What is it? The antidote for the suspected. Well, I'm managing a band. <laughs> <laughs> camera choice here. We get into the handheld mode as the camera goes right up to Jim, who is chuckling heavy. I love this decision and shot. It really hammers home how much of a miserly twat that Jim's being as he leers over the viewer. And poor Ant. Ant is stone-faced watching the TV. He had essentially whispered to Dave to see about the opportunity, and now he's stuck back in his seat, shamed and defeated. But he keeps going soon after, and Ant then details the lineup. And Darren's on bass. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan's on vocals. And Tigsy's on drums. Oh. Little Tigsy on drums. Yeah. Well, more of a drum machine, but yeah. Darren on bass. Great image. I mean, remember at this point, we haven't met Darren properly. We've only heard a reference to him in the first episode as his brother had been on two holidays. Ryan's on vocals, someone we've not heard of before either, along with Tigsy on drums. Little Tigsy, uh, more of a drum machine, apparently, than drums that he's on. I mean, what band wasn't at this point in the late 90s, post Cool Britannia? But apparently they're a cross between Oasis and the Manics, and they do a cover of Wonderwall. Interestingly, apparently without a guitar, though, just a bass and a drum machine, which could be amazing, but I imagine it's not. And just quickly on those two bands as well, I mean, God, what legendary acts the pair of them, to be honest. And Oasis, I've always got a special place in my heart for Oasis. Like, I'm, I'm a bit of a music freak, as maybe you've gathered, but Oasis... 
they're not my favourite band or anything like that, but they were the first band that I became really into when I was like 11, 12, and the first band where I was buying the albums and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, I was there when Dig Out Your Soul and Don't Believe the Truth and all that came out. So I was on the latter end of it, admittedly. And, you know, their first two records and the master plan are, yeah, they're masterpieces in my eyes. They're unbelievable records. So Oasis, as of 2009, Oasis have sold over 70 million records worldwide, making them one of the best-selling bands of all time. They are among the most successful acts in the UK singles charts and albums charts, with eight UK number one singles and eight UK number one albums. The band has also achieved three platinum albums in the US. And the Manics, the Manic Street Preachers, are a Welsh rock band formed in Blackwood in 1986. The band consists of cousins, James Dean Bradfield and Sean Moore, plus Nicky Wire. They are often colloquially known as the Manics, and they form a key part of the 1990s Welsh Cool Cymru cultural movement. That's cool. I've never, I didn't know there was a Welsh equivalent to Cool Britannia. That's interesting. The Manics have headlined festivals including Glastonbury, Tea in the Park, V Festival and Reading. They have won 11 Enemy Awards, 8 Q Awards and 4 Brit Awards and they have sold more than 10 million albums worldwide. Along with the Wonderwall cover though, there are some originals, and they do a song called Access All Areas, which Ryan wrote about his son. Uh, well, we do a cover of Wonderwall, and uh, a song Ryan wrote about his son, Access All Areas. Ryan's never seen his son. Well, yeah, that's what the song's about. You can't get access. Oh, oh man, that is hel- that's probably my favourite moment of the episode. The sincerity of Anthony's delivery there is just killer. Like, I need to hear this song. I need to hear Access All Areas feet Darren on the bass. Bloody hell, though, Dave mutters. Ant returns back to his chair. And then Denise asks, what's the name of the band? And Ant, he delivers it with panache, gesturing with his hands, and he declares, exit. And immediately has to fight his case. No, listen, <laughs> right? It's a marketing thing, yeah, right? Wherever we play, our name's up in lights. Hey, Anthony, that's really clever. It's kind of clever. It's kind of jokey, of course, but it's in the same wheelhouse. You know, we've spoken before about the harebrained royal schemes. It's in the same wheelhouse of Dave upping the price of his first DJ gig to pay for the business cards, or Jim talking about coming home from a night out a little earlier than you said you would. You know, kind of inspired and very much in the lineage of the show. Barb is overjoyed at his nouse, and he is technically right, and sure, Exit is always visible too, but it's hardly blazoned over the stage, is it? I mean, they haven't really saved any money on a lighting rig there. And another problem is, Exit is just a very generic band name, isn't it? And it got me intrigued, actually, so I have just went on Spotify, and there's quite a few bands called Exit. There's lots of variations as well. Exit Wounds, The Exit, Exit 10, Exit North... But uh, yeah, the top exit band, 45,000 monthly listeners here, and they're a pop punk band from New England. So uh, yeah, good luck to that exit at least. Exit my ass, Jim says, obviously, mimicking a pulled toilet chain. Dave is intrigued though, asked if there's any others in the band, probably assuming there's a guitarist. But there is, however, it's Ryan's brother, who's not doing anything but dancing on stage, like Bez from the Happy Mondays. Bez being Mark Berry, better known as Bez, an English percussionist, dancer, DJ and media personality, who is best known as a member of Happy Mondays and Black Grape, where, yeah, he's just the, uh, the silly dancer. But a legend nonetheless, I suppose. And Dave says, you don't want Lewis just stuck at the side of the stage just arsing about, which is nice subtle writing there, as Dave knows the name of this kid, despite him not being named, him just being Ryan's brother beforehand. You know, it adds to the whole reality of the world there, it's fantastic. Ant doesn't want him there, but it's his amps that they use, which, I mean, if he's got the amps, why isn't he playing with them? But, you know, still, none of this really makes much sense, does it? Dave is invested still, however, states that they can play the christening. And I like that we get the reference to the christening here as well. Hey, I've got a gig for you. You can play our christening. Oh, nice one. <laughs> Good luck, Dave. Not have an exit, play access all areas at our baby's christening. I will either give you the gig, Anne. And it's so funny to me that Denise names the band and the song correctly. Not, I don't want Anthony's band at my christening, but I don't want exit playing access all areas there. <laughs> Dave pulls a face to Ant, seems to be standing up to Denise somewhat, but it's something he knew wouldn't fly. It's not like the moped where they both vehemently disagree on it, you know? So he's just having fun to slightly annoy her. Denise, anyway, has made her wish clear. She wants Charlotte Church's tape on at the christening. And Charlotte Church, I mean, obviously a very known figure. 
in British cultural history, uh, a Welsh singer-songwriter, actress, TV presenter and political activist from Cardiff, Wales. And she rose to fame in childhood as a classical singer before branching into pop music in 2005. By 2007, she has sold more than 10 million records worldwide, including over 5 million in the US. And in 2010, she was reported to be worth as much as 11 million pounds. And looking at her Spotify, you know, she's still got a fan base, 93,000 monthly listeners at the time of recording this. Barbara says she thinks Exit sounds great. She hasn't heard them, but she likes anything music Musical, which is very sweet. And Denise then is unnecessarily nasty here, stating that Anthony's only in the band because he can't play anything. Well, I mean, can she play anything? And it kind of reminds me of the last episode we covered where she makes sure that Anthony doesn't go down to the pub because he might get a pint from the guys. She does ask about him being a manager though, and he seems a bit naive here, stating that he'll be taking care of them, record contracts and the like. And Jim goes harder here, harder as ever, stating they'll be at the front, staving off all the groupies as Lewis is giving it all that. I mean, you know, they're having such a laugh at his expense there, but it is quite a funny kind of ludicrous thing, undeniably. Tiggsy, we learn, has some community service for the next year, so conquering America might not be on the cards. Dave continues to laugh. There's a demo coming, but they need Tiggsy's mom to lend them the garage. And Jim says there's no point in going to Abbey Road, you know. I mean, you mentioned Epstein before as well here. There's no point in going there if Joan will lend you the garage. Again, like Dave knowing Lewis's name, it's just a subtle touch here that just really makes the world come alive. Denise says they shouldn't have had Ryan as a singer, as there's nothing about him, kind of like with Dave earlier, so, you know, maybe she shouldn't judge. Barbara laughs about Ryan then to herself. A kid she no doubt remembers from Anthony's youth, you know, they're probably friends, schoolyard, etc. A father at 15, we learn. Eesh. Anthony then asks Dave again about a gig going at the Feathers, if he can ask, you know, for the A&R men. And Jim goes somewhat with the fantasy of them being there and paints a picture of Culture Clash, talking about the bloody Cockney wide boys sitting there with their ponytails alongside daft old Ernie standing by the bar screaming for his own tankard. You know, we've heard about old Frank under the dartboard at the Feathers and, and now here's another particular punter who screams for his own tankard. Barbara ponders on how funny it is that he needs his own tankard and Jim points out, quite rightly really, that it's like Norma and a cup, which is fair, but Barb doesn't take it that way. And it got me wondering there if Norma's ever been down the feathers. I mean, I'm sure she has once or twice. I'm sure Twiggy would get some advocate or whatever. You know, and all this feathers talk has got them clearly thirsty. So he then asked Dave if they can't mosey on down and try and get a gig for Boyzone. Boyzone, of course, being an Irish boy band who were put together in 93 by Louis Walsh. Their most famous lineup was composed of Keith Duffy, Stephen Gately, Mikey Graham, Ronan Keating and Shane Lynch. And as of 2018, they've released seven studio albums and nine compilation albums. In 2012, the official charts company revealed the biggest selling singles artists in British musical chart history, with Boyzone currently placed at 29th and the second most successful boy band in Britain behind Take That. According to the BPI, the British Phonographic Industry, Boyzone has been certified for 6 million albums and over 7 million singles in the UK, with 25 million records sold by 2013 worldwide. And you know what? All of them are junk. Ant says they haven't had enough practice yet, which is odd because he's just been asking Dave multiple times throughout this episode for a chance. And Jim, you know, perhaps withered mentally with thoughts of an impending Norma visit, Jim explodes. Shall we go down the feathers then, Jim, yeah? Dave, you're going nowhere. Hey, Denise, you know them new trousers? They look bloody awful. Ant is hurt now, folds his arms upset. Dave shakes his head a little awkwardly. Barbara looks across to Jim. And Denise again states that she's dying for a wee. Barbara says just go, but she states that she's waiting until she gets home. Dave wants to go to the feathers, but Denise holds him down. And this seems to infuriate Jim further, who is really on the attack now, you know, going straight for Denise's leggings. She comes up with a witty riposte, unlike when she calls him Mr. Generous Head in episode two, stating that he's hardly Bruce Willis in Die Hard. Great line with his vest. Everyone laughs at his expense. Anthony Particular pointing at him, jabbing his hand in his direction. And then the episode closes, quite abruptly, really. Denise again says she's dying for a piss. And Jim erupts again. Oh, look at you in that monkey vest. You're hardly Bruce Willis in Die Hard. (laughs) 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 And this is the fairly typical ending, isn't it? It's normally Jim with a comment like, you know, what have we had this series? We had Keanu in the first episode of series two, him going upstairs. We had I'm going to call Dinah Rod (laughs) when Nana leaves for the toilet. And now we have again Jim just talking about piss and getting annoyed and no doubt not going out. And the world just continues beyond us. So, uh, yeah. Yeah.